it is now time for me to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor John Casey Liu. Uh, he is the chairman of the Building and Planning Research Foundation at the National Taiwan University. Uh, he is an educator, community planner, architect and activist. He has over 30 years of experience providing planning and design services to improve the everyday uh, living environment of more than 500 communities. So now I will uh, pass the time over to our keynote speaker, Professor John Dew. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm really happy to see some old friends, Hoi Peng, Yongqi, Peng Kiang, and to meet all the new friends. Uh, I understand there, there's a large group of uh, people joining the session, and it is uh, a very important topic at this time. Um, I hope to use my contribution to uh, give you a sense of why I think it is a good time uh, to uh, seriously consider uh, engagement in community design. As Hoi Peng just mentioned, uh, it is probably time to uh, try to make participation engagement as a central issue uh, in planning and design as we move forward. Um, but first, I do want to say a few words very quickly about uh, what I understand to be the problem. Mm, the problem as I see is really a contradiction, a dichotomy, a conflict today in the world between individualism and community. And at least in the West, uh, <clears throat> the idea that uh, we live primarily as individuals um, began as early as the 17th century. It probably started from the Greeks in the West, but in the 17th century, John Locke and many philosophers at that time advocated a way of looking at human relationships. Now, this is what they call social contract. Social contract is basically uh, trying to make people relating to other people based on some contractual agreement. And we call it functional and utilitarian. Society is basically organized by contractual relations between individuals. And this is probably the early beginnings of mm, competition and meritocracy. Each person basically is out for him or herself. Now, in the, in the 19th century, uh, the American experience uh, in individualism is well observed by the Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville. And he's the one that invented the term individualism. The idea that individual comes first became an ideology. And along with democratic development, 
the American system of democracy, where one person has one vote, what you end up with is really a tyranny of majority, tyranny of the majority. Basically, if you're in the minority, you have no voice. If you're in the minority, you always lose out. So the European idea of social contract combined with the American new frontier created what we now face in the world, which is really uh, rampant individualism. So as a result of these developments in the West, at least since the end of the Second World War in the United States, people realized, ordinary citizens realized that the social aspect of human life is being eroded, is in decline. And that's really the cause of the social movements in the 1960s, which I experienced. And of the many different kinds of protests, I think there are three which are the key. Civil rights movement in the United States, pushing for the rights of minority uh, groups. The anti-Vietnam War in the 60s, which is opposing American intervention in the world and also the free speech movement on campus. In 1958, C. Wright Mills wrote a very important book, The Sociological Imagination, in which he said, the challenge of the 20th century is how individuals can place the personal within the context of a larger structure that is the community. And so he saw as a sociologist, sociologist that the community is in decline. Then towards the end of the 20th, 20th century, another important book, uh, Robert Bella called Habits of the Heart, and what he said was American individualism as it has developed throughout the 20th century has become excessively expressive in total disregard of other people. It's what you wanna do, whatever you wanna do is fine. Um, you are, um, you only need to concern uh, about yourself. Um, and you don't have to worry about what others, th others think of you. In, in this sense, community has become elusive and no longer relevant. This is really the background during the 20th century. The decline of the community that led to, among many, many spheres of society, our profession, the planning and design profession, to try to do something about it. Uh, okay, so the second point I wanna make is how the university uh, engaged itself in the, in the community both in teaching as well as in practice. Since, ever since the 1960s, in the United States, uh, the, prof the profession realized that uh, the community needed help, needed regeneration. Uh, 
And many of us who uh, grew up uh, in those years, went to school in those years, I think remember very well the efforts that were made. And one of which is the establishment of community design centers, beginning first in Philadelphia and later in many cities across the US including Berkeley. Now at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley Architecture Department, at that time, we started what was called the social factors emphasis, uh, an option in the architecture degree program where you can concentrate on understanding sociological factors affecting design. For example, a design studio focused entirely specifically on understanding the disabled and handicapped users of public spaces. And as a result of the stu studio, it led directly to the first planning code on wheelchair access, uh, for example, on what we know we are now familiar with, the curb cuts to allow accessibility of wheelchairs on sidewalks, uh, which began here in Berkeley, spread out over the country and now around the world. And all this is an example of what we needed to do um, on the ground in the community to make everyday life better for many people, including uh, the minority, the handicapped um, groups. Along with uh, work on the ground, trying to improve. Of course, there were many, many different aspects of social, psychological, behavioral uh, factors that required theoretical and more academic research to really understand uh, the relationship between people and the environment. And here I only mention at Berkeley uh, a few of the notable um, examples. Christopher Alexander, a pattern language. Ray Lifshay, who worked on the Handicap Accessibility Studio, has a book called Design for Independent Living. And Claire Cooper Marcus, Housing as If, people matter. These are examples of the research work that were being done at the time. Then when we try to move away or from the academy into the community, uh, here I give an example of professional practice uh, called Community Design Collaborative. Uh, it is made up of a multicultural collaboration of African-American, Asian-American, Native American professionals. It is multidisciplinary in nature, collaboration of planners, architects, sociologists, and economists, uh, and other expertise. And during those years, we try to develop participatory methodologies in engaging the community, both in research, in planning, as well as in design. And some of the examples are public housing for low-income families in San Francisco, Chinatown elderly housing, 
Native American University campus planning, a black repertory theater, the design of a theater, a free clinic uh, in, in Berkeley, um, medical clinic. These are some of the examples that we engaged ourselves in. Okay, so back uh, from, the, from, like, from the 60s throughout the 70s into the 80s, I think our profession uh, took a stance that one, we need to go out from the ivory tower into the community and work directly in the community. And two, we needed to do something very quickly to resist the forces of individualism and to recapture what was left of community. Okay, so by the 1990s, while I was teaching at NTU Taiwan Graduate Institute of Building and Planning and also practicing at the Building and Planning Research Foundation. Here, I want to focus one on teaching participatory planning and design. Two examples. One is an undergraduate design studio, which is a two semester intensive. Each semester, six units, student earns six units in one semester. So in two semesters, student earns 12 units. So it's a lot of work. Uh, almost takes up at least half of a student's time. This course, each year we took 12 students and they're all from different discipline on campus, on the National Taiwan University campus. So for example, we have, we, each year we get people from besides our profession, besides uh, uh, planning, architecture and design, they come from engineering, they come from economics, from sociology, philosophy, uh, even some people, uh, some students from medicine, uh, et cetera. But, the important thing is that we want to create a learning atmosphere where people, students can learn from each other as well as they learn from the teacher. So the number 12 is really important because the number 12 can work easily as a group. And then throughout the semester, we can have the group divided into two groups of six, three groups of four, four groups of three, six groups of two. And when you mix them up and work in that way, you quickly find that students among different disciplines, they start learning from each other very quickly. A philosopher student will learn very fast from an engineering student and vice versa, okay? Then uh, we also uh, try to work on real world problems. So this course over the years have become one of the most important courses um, on the National Taiwan University campus that is open to all departments, all disciplines. The second example 
is a first year postgraduate student, when you come into the graduate school, it's the first planning studio that you take. And it's also two semesters long. But here we have 30 interdisciplinary students. Each year we receive from an application pool of maybe four or five times the size, 30 students. And again, they come from all disciplines. We reserve half of the 30 to professional background students. And the other half, we open to any other discipline, uh, as long as you have had a college degree. We, here, it is even more uh, important to encourage multidisciplinary learning. And over the years, we have found that students learn from each other much more than they learn individually from the professor or the instructor. Of course, I am not saying instructors and teachers, professors are limited in their knowledge. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that in our field of work, we need many, many different kinds of knowledge to solve a real world problem. And it is, it is important that students can learn, can appreciate that knowledge come from different sources. Okay. Then, we encourage student initiative in problem identification. We generally do not assign a problem statement to the student groups. We let the students out into the community to identify what is a real problem. And part of this is getting to know the community and to design the participatory process, and then to uh, implement the project. I emphasize designing the participatory process because there is no one participatory method. Each time you go into a community, it's a new social situation. We may have basic values. We may have basic orientation, perspective. But each time, how to actually engage the community will be different. So each time is tailor-made. OK. That is uh, the, in the academic part. But at the same time, uh, the Graduate Institute uh, started a professional service unit called the Building and Planning Research Foundation. And it is interdisciplinary within and outside the organization. We have professionals architects, planners, designers in the organization. But we also have people who are sociologists, ec economists, geographers, um, engineers, 
working within and on special projects, we would have uh, specialist experts join us working as a team. We focus on public work for public agencies, parks, schools, theaters, hospitals, new town planning, historical preservation. We engage community residents in direct participation as much as possible from the very beginning. Even when we are doing basic research, um, finding out, um, gathering data, um, documenting the community, we try to do it in a participatory way. The students that we have often act as team members in this process. Graduate students in their second, third, fourth years, they may participate in our work at the foundation and they receive extra credits for it. Once they graduate, many of them join our organization as our staff planners and designers. Okay. Here, I just a few points on thinking over the years what we have learned. One is that knowledge and wisdom of good and optimal solution to problems of the environment really reside within everyday communities. The source of such knowledge and wisdom is predicated on the strength of the local culture and history of that community. A stronger community, the community is better able to come up with good solutions to problems. So our task is to help, to encourage that community to become strong. Um, we might say empowerment or capacity building, but I want to give a slightly different um, slightly different take on capacity building and empowerment. It's not that we are giving it to the community. It's not we are doing something for the community, but our know-how, professional know-how, and the local community knowledge interact in mutually beneficial and reciprocally respectful ways to achieve, to achieve a balance, okay? And this is a very important point. And I think um, Ben Kiang will be speaking to that. That is, uh, we are not doing this strictly as a one way for the community, but we're doing it along with the community. And we have to learn how to understand what that community is about. Early and direct participation of the community in all aspects of the process increases the level of energy of the community. 
and leads to heightened sense of collective identity with the project. So this point is that as early as you can, you engage the community. Do not wait until uh, later in the project uh, when you're trying to get some input from them. Now, the last point, I believe there's a shift from a 20th century liberal professionalism to an unintrusive and non-extractive, but empathetic and collaborative professionalism. And here, practicing empathy becomes a key skill for our profession going forward. So what I'm saying, what I would like to point out is that uh, at least in my experience, uh, under the Western influence in the past century, the community that we know, something that is deeply rooted in our culture and history is in decline. And we're trying to counter that. We're trying to resist that. We're trying to recapture it. And we're trying to recreate it. Um, okay, Prof. Uh, John, before we launch into your uh, case study part of your presentation, we've got about five more minutes till uh, the Q&A. So we, we could wrap it up uh, in, okay. in a short while. Yeah. The case study is um, one of the earliest projects that we have done um, in the city of Taipei. Okay, I just want to show you the steps quickly. The first step is the students dis discover a dump site and they wanted to uh, do something about that. But they discover that the reason why it's a dump site is because there's a conflict between uh, factions of the community. Okay. So the first thing to do is to find some way of getting into the community, setting up an on-site station, workstation, and then spending time with people to figure out what the problem is. And to figure out the problem, you need to do something along with it. And the first thing that we did is to uh, have kids involved because when kids start doing something, adults listen, adults pay attention because their children are getting involved. We then do something along with the adults. Here, a very important thing is that we ask the people of the different factions to point out what is good and what is not so good about their community, okay? And because of that exercise, the two factions of the community came together because they realized that what they consider good and not so good, what they like and what they dislike are very, very similar to each other before they were fighting. Now, through this exercise, they begin to talk to each other. And in the meantime, the kids are drawing up what they think a good park will be like. 
The third part is to get different groups of the community to actually design a park that they think is their preferred solution. But here the problem I want to show is that um, well, at the end of this exercise, we ask people to vote on what they prefer. And as some of you might already uh, can tell, uh, voting is not the best way to go. And I said before, uh, there's a tyranny of uh, the majority. And also uh, <coughs> the fact that older people in our culture thought it wasn't a good idea for young people, for kids to even be able to vote. So we stopped the process and then we grouped in two weeks. So sometimes if something goes wrong in the process, uh, you have to stop, regroup and rethink. So after two weeks of uh, renegotiating and communication, we use a different method to reach a consensus and compromise on the design. Okay. And um, these are a few slides uh, to show. Uh, and that's the end of the semester. And the students uh, have gone their own way. But we needed more time to finish the construction documents to do all the necessary things uh, to make that park, uh, to realize that park. And uh, many of the students uh, decided to volunteer their time to help uh, complete uh, this project. Okay. Uh, and this is the use of the park uh, today, uh, just re very recently. Uh, here, the two points is, is, is that uh, each, each time you do a participatory uh, pro process is different because the situation is different. Uh, here, even though we made a park and we realized the park and it looks ordinary, but in fact, what it did through the process is that we changed the nature of the community. Uh, we actually were able to implement uh, community-based, community-initiated maintenance organizations that have existed and operating all through these years. Okay? That's really the important piece. So I think I will stop here. Uh, and I have just a few more points to make, uh, which I will save if at the end of the Q&A, uh, I could have two more minutes, uh, I'll finish this uh, part. John is okay, uh, you could proceed. We can uh, eat into the Q&A time. You go ahead. I should go ahead? Yes, please okay. go ahead. Okay, the last point I want to make is that I believe there's a shifting perspective, uh, which is coming and we can see it uh, very strongly uh, from individualism to community. Okay. So we, instead of seeing individuals as the beginning of social relations, we now can look at community as really the basic unit of our different societies. There's a shift from top down to bottom up, which most of us are aware of. From external intervention to internal initiatives. And I think through participation and engagement, this is what we see. And I think in a global sense, 
from the west to the east. And my point here is that in the east, we still have a strong basis of the community. The community, even in the context of globalization, the community is essentially intact. The culture, the history, the ways of life, um, the local environment, etc. So we need to be very cognizant of this important shift. Second point, before, in the Western tradition, we go from the Greeks to the 17th century social contract to the American individualism. But within the shift, it is important to gain an appreciation of our multicultural different sources of wisdom of the community from various philosophies of the West. For example, in China, Confucius emphasizes kindness and honor as a fundamental tenet of human interaction, which clearly suggests that the social or the community aspects are of primary importance over and above the individual. But another less well-known ancient sage, also from China, about the same time as Confucius, his name is Mozi. He goes a step further to advocate mutuality and reciprocity, quite specifically in his text, Mutuality and Reciprocity, which rests on the understanding of humans as empathetic beings. So we are empathetic by nature. And if we can exercise empathy in our professional work, we will have taken a big step forward. So I believe that drawing from multicultural sources of wisdom, new theoretical discourses on community design engagement will emerge in the foreseeable future. And I believe many of you among this audience at this gathering will be the ones to de develop both the theoretical discourse as well as the hands-on practice on the ground. And this will lead to entirely new and humane designs. And I'm, even at my age, I'm optimistic of seeing this happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>